Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Columbia Psychiatry Grand Rounds. I hope everybody is in fine fettle this morning, and a good welcome to everybody here in the auditorium. Um, for those of you who are in person today, if you didn't on your way in, um, please make sure that you scan the QR codes. They are at the, um, on the tables um, at the entrance, but there's also a few located um, at the front of the auditorium. Um, there you will be able to um, receive a, uh, you'll, sorry, you'll be able to receive your CE credits for completing the survey, and then following that, you'll um, receive a second email with a survey asking for your opinions on the objectives on the content of today's session. So uh, good morning. Um, for those on Zoom, my name is Kate Elkington, and I am one of the Grand Rounds Committee co-chairs, along with Drs. Jeff Miller and Christine Denny. And we welcome everybody here to uh, today's hybrid Columbia Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Um, just an announcement before we, actually we have a few announcements before we get started. So I'm actually gonna crack on to make sure we have enough time for, our, um, for today's speaker. Um, next week, there are no grand rounds due to the APA meeting in New Orleans. Um, there are several of us um, that are going to be presenting um, at the um, conference. So I believe an email was sent out. Be sure to um, see who and what time and, um, and the topics that are going to be presented by our staff. Uh, then grand rounds will resume June 1st. Um, and we will have Dr. Alyssa Appel, the Professor and Vice Chair from the Department of Psychiatry, um, UCSF, and the title of her talk is gonna be Stress and Aging, How Psych Psychological Stress Ac Accelerates or Shows Cellular, sorry, or Slows the Cellular Aging Process. Um, and now I wanna uh, just mention a few awards and honors that have been conferred by our um, faculty. First of all, our own Dr. Blair Simpson, the interim chair of the Department of Psychiatry here at Columbia, as well as Dr. Myrna Weissman, the Diana, uh, the Diane Goldman Kemper Family Professor of Epidemiology in Psychiatry, were recipients of the Society of Biological Psychiatry's George N. Thompson Founders Award, um, along with other members of the Society's Women Leadership Group. The award honors members of the society who have given outstanding service to promote the welfare of the organization, so congratulations. Also, Dr. Weissman was the recipient of the American College of Psychiatrists 2023 Mood Disorders Award. This award recognizes outstanding contributions to the understanding and treatment of mood disorders. And this award is gonna be presented at the, college, the um, college's annual meeting in Tucson, Arizona um, in February of 23. Um, finally, um, Dr. Elizabeth Ford, who is, the, who is the Associate Professor of Clinical Psychiatry and also the Director in, um, of Mental Health and Criminal Justice Initiatives here in the department. She was awarded the Judge Stephen Gross Memorial Leadership Award for her, uh, for her work with people um, with behavioral health needs involved in the criminal legal system. And the award was presented um, in March at the Judges and Psychiatrists Leadership Summit. So congratulations. And then finally, uh, Dr. Marissa Spann, who is the um, Herving, Herbert Irving Associate Professor of Medical Psychology, um, was one of the 2022 uh, Faculty Service Award winners. The award recognizes full-time faculty whose extraordinary and creative voluntary service has contributed significantly to the university's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. So again, congratulations to all the award winners. Um, lastly, I would like to just highlight some recent um, uh, grant recipients. Dr. Maura Baldrini has received a five-year $4 million um, dollar R01 from the National Institute of Aging for her project titled New Technologies to Identify Mole Molecular Regulators of the Hi Human Hippocampus Neurogenic Niche in Healthy Aging and Alzheimer's Disease. Um, so congratulations, Dr. Baldrini. We also have Dr. Emily Page received a five-year, $1 million K01 from the NIMH for her project titled Addressing Economic Marginalization to Improve HIV Prevention and Care Outcomes Among Gender Minorities in the United States. Um, and then finally, we have an award that was uh, conferred internally, the Schaefer Research Scholars um, Award. Each year, the program presents awards to four research scientists, two residing or working in the Americas and two residing or working outside the Americas. These um, scientists must have distinguished themselves in the science of human physiology and whose current work is of outstanding merit with significant academic distinction. This year, 
Um, the, the award is made possible through a, a bequest from Dr. Ludwig Schaefer, and each year consists of a $50,000 cash prize, as well as up to $200,000 in direct research support. This year, Dr. D Dennis David, Uh, this year's award winner was Dr. Um, Dennis David, a professor of pharmacology from the University of Paris-Saclay in France. And he's also this year will be working with Dr. Um, Drs. Hen and Denny in their lab, um, laboratories, both of which are housed in the Department of Psychiatry. And his project is titled Novel Pharmacological Drugs for Psychiatric Diseases tar Targeting Glutaminergic and Serotonergic Transmission in the Hippocampus. Um, and lastly, I would just like to remind everybody that June 8th is Psychiatry's annual meeting. It's going to be here. Uh, it will be hybrid, so we will do both in the auditorium and via Zoom, beginning at 11 a.m., Wednesday, June 8th. And the word on the street is that there will be lunch afterwards, so please try and join us. Um, so now I would like to turn it over to um, Dr. Um, Jeremy... Um, so now I want to turn it over to um, Dr. Jeremy. Dr. Minster Jeremy. Van <laughs> Minster Vanderbilt works just fine, and I could I can take it from here. I, and I'm sorry, it sounds like there is something happening in the back background. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, I was just waiting to see if it was going to happen again. Sorry, I, I'll just talk, turn it over to you, um, Jeremy. Sorry about that. To introduce our De Hirsch Grand Round speaker. Super. Um, thank you. And my apologies for not being there in person. Um, I'm still in the CDC period post COVID where I shouldn't be in a group of people without a mask on. So my apologies for that. I, before starting, I just wanted to pause and say we should all applaud. That's a whole lot of things to celebrate. Um, Myrna, Blair, Elizabeth, Maura, Marissa, uh, Emily, Renee, uh, Christine. I, I mean, it's just remarkable. So congratulations all. Um, and recognizing I'm not, not in person, I can't clap with you. Um, it's really a pleasure to introduce the De Hirsch Grand Rounds and to get to introduce an internal speaker for the De Hirsch Grand Rounds. So I'll say a few words about the Grand Rounds um, itself, um, its legacy, and then uh, introduce Dr. Margolis. Um, so in 1989, the Kovner family uh, gave a gift um, in honor of uh, Katrina de Hirsch. Um, Dr. De Hirsch was a speech therapist who pioneered the field of uh, childhood language and learning. Um, she was active within the New York Presbyterian Services, uh, working to tackle the challenge of dyslexia and learning disabilities for children in the local community. The gift initially supported the de Hirsch Robinson Reading Clinic. Um, and then uh, reflecting on de Hirsch's legacy, uh, the gift uh, was extended to include this Grand Round series. Uh, and this Grand Round series really is to be delivered by a distinguished expert in reading disorders and pediatric mental health, really thinking about intersection um, and recognizing that children with learning disorders uh, frequently also struggle with mental health conditions, uh, sometimes as a result of not having their learning disability recognized uh, early enough. So it's really a pleasure to uh, in the course of a series of quite wonderful De Hirsch lectures, uh, include one of our own. Um, so Dr. Amy Margolis, who we'll hear from today, is an associate professor here in medical psychology. Uh, she's really an outstanding clinician, clinician scientist in quite a number of ways, um, including in her pathway to get to this point. Uh, Amy completed her undergraduate work at UC Berkeley. She then did a PhD uh, in psychology at Teachers College an internship, postdoctoral training, uh, became a clinical neuropsychologist and practiced for a decade, um, learned to work with kids assessing and, and treating learning disorders. Um, and in the course of that work, uh, became inspired to better understand um, the risk factors, the brain basis, and how we could better deliver treatments uh, for kids with specific learning disorders, including kids um, whose uh, difficulties oftentimes uh, elude easy diagnosis. Um, and one example of that is kids with nonverbal learning disability. Uh, so 
inspired to go back to research, uh, she came here to our department, became a T32 postdoctoral research fellow. Um, she then wove a unique path between our department um, and the Department of Public Health um, that was made possible in a number of ways, largely hard work and perseverance, uh, as well as brilliance, um, but also with funding from philanthropy that was really inspired to carry this unusual path forward. Um, that support came from the Nonverbal Learning Disability Project, as well as the Promise Project. She then was incredibly successful landing a K award and then a couple of R01s, as well as a Learning Disability Hub grant, which would be the first for our institution. It's a pre-center grant uh, focused on uh, innovation in learning disabilities. Her work uh, in the Environment, Brain, and Behavior Lab focuses on three major topics. One, as noted, is understanding environmental risk factors for specific learning disorders. Another is understanding, and really this intersects beautifully with the Hirsch legacy, the psychological aspects of kids struggling with specific learning disorders. And then the evaluation and treatment of developmental visual spatial disorder, which was previously known as nonverbal learning disability. And uh, Amy, together with Prudence Fisher here in the department, have a proposal in front of the DSM committee uh, to include this as a, a new or refined uh, category within the DSM. In addition to all of this work, um, she's a wonderful mentor, colleague, um, friend to many in the department, um, and extracurricularly is engaged as the text revisor for the chapter on specific learning disability for the DSM-5-TR, um, as well as co-chairing the neurodevelopment working group for ECHO, which is the cohort study uh, extending across the country, uh, the environmental influences on child mental health outcome study of which we have uh, three participating sites here. So it's really a pleasure to hand off to uh, Amy, really looking forward to this talk. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Jeremy. That was an incredible introduction. Thank you so much. And welcome, everybody. Um, Simon's bringing up my slides, I think. It's really an incredible honor to be here today, um, invited to give this to Hirsch Robinson Grand Rounds. Uh, as Jeremy mentioned, we've had a number of these over the years, and I've had the pleasure of helping select those people. So when I was asked, it was really like, what, me? <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk today about some of the many um, exposures that children face in their environment, and um, specifically prenatal um, exposure to um, developmental neurotoxicants, as well as exposures to social stressors. And um, can I just turn this a little bit? I bet I can. And how these um, exposures can impair reading and other cognitive functions, and um, through um, brain-dependent mechanisms then um, look and suggest that this way of thinking can identify novel avenues for um, uh, thoughts about how to treat learning problems, particularly in children from environmentally, uh, from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, sorry. So um, I'm gonna begin by setting the stage and talk a little bit about specific learning disorders and um, give you some important facts and information about this and then talk about chemical exposures and then um, finally show you work that we've been doing to support our theory of environmentally associated phenotypes of learning problems and <clears throat> how we hope to expand this work and continue supporting this um, theoretical perspective. So what is specific learning disorder? A learning disorder um, as defined in the DSM is characterized by a failure to acquire an academic skill in the presence of otherwise intact development. And so it's important to know this is not intellectual disability, this is not developmental disability, but rather um, this is when a child has a difficulty um, acquiring a particular academic skill like reading, writing, or math in the presence of otherwise intact development. And so I'm gonna to start today with an exercise to show you uh, really what I'm talking about and um, specifically how I believe that cognitive processes continue, uh, contribute to the acquisition of academic skills. So if you're here in the auditorium, we've kind of a big turnout. Uh, I hope you have a paper and a pen. Some people from my lab have been handing those out. And if you're at home, just grab a paper and pen. If you're a true 21st century human and you have no paper and pen, just use your pointer finger and the surface in front of you as a pen. I think um, Paige might come around and give out paper and pen if you need it. Um,
Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I want you to take the pen and hold it in your non-dominant hand. So if you're a righty, put the pen in your left hand. If you're at home and you have no pen, use your left pointer finger if you're a righty, and just copy this sentence onto the paper in front of you. I'm gonna give you, you know, maybe 20 seconds to work on this. Clearly, right? That's the point. <laughs> so it's pretty challenging, right? Now I'm going to have you start. I know you haven't finished, but I want you to shift gears and still using your non-dominant hand, try to write a descriptive sentence using two adjectives describing the view out your bedroom window. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Um, when I do this talk for teachers and other professionals who work with children with learning problems, <clears throat> I ask them, how did you feel? Do you have any thoughts? We heard that someone in the audience said this 20 seconds certainly wouldn't be enough time. These are the kinds of comments I get. My hand hurts, I have no idea what I wrote. I, have, I wrote a terrible sentence, my handwriting is terrible, I didn't use any capital letters, I don't remember the sentence I copied. And I do this exercise to show you how cognitive processes contribute to academic skills. Um, if you think of a computer as an analogy for the brain, a computer has RAM that allows it to operate multiple complex um, programs simultaneously. And in this exercise, what I did was really um, deplete your RAM by inducing a motor deficit. And I induced that deficit by having you use your non-dominant hand. So something that used to be effortless and automatic, like handwriting, suddenly requires a lot of complex cognitive computations. And that is going to deplete your resources available for more complex programs, if you go back to the um, computer analogy. And so what I've done here is give you this motor deficit, right? And um, when this is not um, effortless and automatic, then it probably became hard to do a writing task. And I think you'll notice if you look at your sentence um, that you didn't write a very complicated sentence. Maybe you wrote, when I look out the window, I see a bird and a wall. But if I didn't let make you use your non-dominant hand, you might have written on Sunday mornings when I don't have to get up and go to work, I like to relax in my bedroom and the view out the window shows and you can see how there's embedded clauses and ex extra information that you don't include when writing those words is using so much cognitive resources that you are trying to reserve energy. Um, and similarly, you could potentially see how this motor deficit influenced your memory. You probably don't remember much about the sentence that I had you copy. Your note taking might also be a mess on the paper. It might not be very well um, organized on that piece of paper. Can you imagine if I had asked you to do long division with your non-dominant hand so you could see how motor skills could disrupt math? And the point of these images is just to show you, uh, for example, if you have a motor deficit and speech is an oromotor skill, it could affect your ability um, for language output or for attention because of interference with motor planning or executive functions where it's hard to sequence things and put them in order. Social emotional skills can become involved if it's hard because of motor skills to engage in play and games. Uh, reading, in fact, requires a lot of visual scanning, which is a motor act. And then um, visual spatial skills themselves can be hard because you have to complete these paper and pencil tasks. And so the point of these um, images is to show you that whatever cognitive skill is in the middle is going to contribute to these other academic and cognitive skills around the periphery. I'm not gonna focus today's talk on motor deficits, but more on things like language comprehension and the downstream effects of having problems in language. But it's pretty hard for me to induce a language deficit in you. And and so the motor um, is a great example to give the audience a sense of what's happening. So I'm gonna take a minute and define some terms that I think are important to understand um, and understand the difference. So I think you can see my pointer here at home, yeah? So learning disorders, as I said, are defined in the DSM um, and they require, this diagnosis requires that an individual have academic skills below average relative to their age peers 
or relative to their own other abilities. And they also require more than just a test score, uh, certain um, holistic assessments of the child, how's their development, and have they had adequate opportunity for instruction, which is a key factor in the um, learning disorder diagnosis. And um, people interchangeably switch between specific learning disorder and learning disorder. So I just want to note that here. People will say SLD or LD. And then um, we can get more um, specific in, in categorizing someone and say they have a learning disability, which means that the disorder is actually rising to the level of a disability, which is a legal um, criterion. And uh, learning disability is protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act or the individual um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, for children in school. And when a disorder reaches the level of a disability, then you may be entitled to certain accommodations in education, like extended time on tests or access to um, extra services at school. And then the more broad term that I like to use in my work is learning problem. And this is where we can start to think dimensionally rather than categorically about these problems. And so rather than thinking, does someone meet criteria or not for a disorder or disability, we're looking at children who are falling in the bottom quartile, so below the 25th percentile, on performance on tests of academic skills. And this is really important when we're thinking about kids from economically disadvantaged backgrounds because they may have um, risk factors that make it hard to make the diagnosis. So if you're living in a shelter and moving um, from shelter to shelter, you may move from school to school, and then it would be hard to determine if you had adequate opportunity for instruction. But certainly that shouldn't block someone from having um, services or the kinds of help they need for having a learning problem. Okay, so why should we study learning problems? Uh, the prevalence is somewhere between 5 and 15 percent. There haven't been many excellent prevalence studies, and certainly none in the last 20 years. But given that there are about 75 million children in, in the U.S., roughly 7 million have a learning disorder, and of those, 80 percent have a reading problem. And this means that in a first grade classroom, most kids are going to learn to read and go on to graduate just fine. But the prevalence estimates suggest that two or three kids in every regular classroom are going to have some sort of learning problem, likely in reading. And if you have a reading problem in first grade, you have a 75% chance of having a, being a poor reader in high school, which puts you on a path of increased risk for things like school failure, physical health problems, alcohol and substance use, depression and anxiety, and reduced employment. And these numbers change when we're talking about children who are living in the context of economic disadvantage. And this has come to be known as the achievement gap. So these are data I'm showing you. I've made these graphs. You can do this too. You can go to the nationsreportcard.gov and you can look at all kinds of factors. And what I'm showing you here are the children's, uh, the na national grade four reading scores and grade eight. And the thing to appreciate is that the um, Open circles are the children who are eligible for free lunch, and the open crosses are those who are not eligible for free lunch. So these are the economically disadvantaged children who are clearly lagging behind the economically advantaged children. And you can see that um, over the last two decades, we have not moved this needle at all. And this is a really a major public health crisis where we have just done nothing to improve reading outcomes for children who are living in economic disadvantage. The last thing I want to say by way of background about learning disorders and disability is that because these are educational in nature, they are, trigger federal laws and protections, which is great, uh, and they also allow for children to have educational treatments. Um, but this also means that SLD doesn't really have a home in psychiatry and psychology. And as way of demonstrating that, this is the NIMH website and their health topics that they're interested in. This is from last week. These were the featured health topics. And you can see that learning disorder obviously isn't there. They don't fund learning disability research. And the problem is that sends this message that learning disorders are not a mental health problem. And that leads to two major issues. One is that um, learning disorders, or, or one is that psychotherapy really isn't available for individuals with learning disorders. In our country, if you um, have a diagnosis and a treatment code, they have to match in order to have uh, your insurance company cover your services. So if you have diabetes, you can have insulin. If you have cancer, you can have chemotherapy. If you have almost any neurodevelopmental disorder, autism, ADHD, 
Tourette's, you're entitled to psychotherapy. But if you have specific learning disorder, you are not entitled to psychotherapy. And this means that children have no access to services, but also that researchers, for the most part, are not trying to develop psychotherapy for learning disorders, which have psychological and um, components that don't yield really to cognitive or educational interventions and really require psychotherapy to address, for example, the view of yourself that might be changed because you have a problem learning. Um, and so that is one of the major problems. And I, I do want to note that there is someone here at Columbia, Laura Mufson, who has actually spent a good chunk of time trying to develop IPT and adapt it for learning disorders. That's one example of how psychotherapy is trying to address learning problems. And the other is Dr. Sharon Vaughn, who's next year's DeHirsch Robinson speaker, and will come and talk to us about how she's inserting cognitive behavioral techniques into reading intervention to address the anxiety that children sometimes feel when they're learning to read. Um, the other major problem that happens when we don't view learning disorders as a mental health problem is um, that we haven't really studied SLD then in circuit psychiatry. And the explosion of knowledge that's happened in systems neuroscience over the last 20 years has not been applied to the problem of learning problems. And that's really where I focus my work. So what do we know about the reading circuit and neuroscience of reading? We know from 20 years of research that if you take typically developing readers and put them in an MRI machine and have them do reading or a reading-related task, that you identify this left lateralized reading circuit. So this is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. If you peeled away my skull, you would see the left lateral circuit of surface of the brain. And these black dots represent regions that work in concert to help an individual when they're trying to read. And this is the reading circuit in a sort of cartoon. We also know that if you take adults or children who have trouble with reading, or classic dyslexia, and you put them in the scanner and have them do this same reading-related task, that they show underactivation of these posterior regions and overactivation of this frontal region and overactivation of some right hemisphere homologous regions. And this has come to be known as the neural signature of dyslexia. But what's really important to appreciate about this is that most of this work has been conducted in individuals from high socioeconomic status backgrounds. And the issue of economic advantage hasn't really been investigated in terms of its modulatory effects on the brain behavior relationships uh, when we think about the brain and reading. So Kim Noble uh, did do an interesting study in 2006 where she looked at children who are having trouble learning to read. So here's a little girl. She can't decide, does it say rat or rate? Um, and when Kim looked at children from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds and put them in the scanner and had them do this same reading-related task, she found that their brains looked like normal reading brains. And that was quite a conundrum because these children couldn't read. Uh, and it led us to wonder, if the reading circuit isn't going wrong for these kids, what is going wrong? And that's what I have really been trying to uh, think hard about for the last five or seven years, I guess, or 10 years, um, since, especially since beginning my career development award, which um, I worked on with Dr. Marsh here and Dr. Rao over in public health. And so when I began this work, I started thinking about the things that we knew were etiologic factors and learning problems. And reading researchers had done a lot of really excellent work looking at the environment and environmental factors and how those contribute to reading problems. So are there toys in the home? Are there people giving examples of reading in the home? Are people doing other activities? And even careful, really careful characterization of a child, like how much time does the child spend reading? Because the more you read, the better reader you become. But if you have a reading problem, you might not want to read. And you can see how that would really affect someone's trajectory. So reading researchers had done very careful work thinking about the household level or the individual level environment and how that contributed to reading. And during this time, I was collaborating with people at Mailman in the environmental health science and population and family health um, departments. And they were asking me to come along and help them think about how these myriad chemicals in our environment that are developmental neurotoxicants might be influencing neurodevelopmental outcomes. And they were especially interested in things like ADHD and anxiety and autism spectrum disorder. But no one over there had thought about learning problems. And no one on the learning disability research side had thought about the chemical environment. And so in my work, I've tried to synthesize these two fields. 
Um, and, you know, I just take a little pause and talk about how the toxic properties of things like lead and their effects on cognitive development are really well known. But it is not so obvious where all these developmental neurotoxicants come from. And in 2014, Phil Landrigan coined this term, the chemical brain drain, and showed that there were at least 12 known developmental neurotoxicants circulating in our environment. And people in mailmen are doing work that is allowing us to ban these kinds of chemicals. And the problem is that in our country, chemicals come to market unless they cause gross dysfunction in an adult. And children are much more vulnerable to much lower levels of exposure because they are smaller, because their metabolisms are faster, and because their brains are rapidly developing. And the fetal brain is the most rapidly developing. And placing the, um, the, the um, pregnancy period in the fetal brain as incredibly um, vulnerable period of time when exposure to even small amounts of these chemicals can have big effects downstream. And so, um, this, all of this awareness has led to people really working very hard to change regulatory uh, controls for how chemicals come to market, but we have a lot of work to do before we get there. Um, and you may, may remember when chlorpyrifos was banned last year, it's largely Virginia Rouse's work, and things like flame retardants have been banned because of Julie Herbstman and others' work. So um, it's only through these kinds of studies that we are able to ban these chemicals. Um, okay, so in my work, I'm trying to synthesize these two fields where uh, the learning disability researchers weren't thinking about the chemical environment, and the chemical people weren't thinking about learning as an outcome. And this led me to hypothesize the existence of these environmentally associated phenotypes of learning problems. And I hypothesized that the problems that children from economically disadvantaged backgrounds are um, experiencing could derive from dysfunction in neural circuits, either similar to the ones that have already been understood or in unique ways. Um, and that's what we've really been trying to uncover. And so we go after these environmentally associated phenotypes of learning problems, and we interrogate this model by focusing on the effects of exposure in the prenatal period when this graph is just showing you all the complexities that are happening during the prenatal period through the first year of life. And um, to do this, we recruit, ooh, that's the wrong button. To do this, we recruit pregnant women into longitudinal prospective birth cohorts. And I'm going to show you some of the work I've been doing with the CCCEH next door, the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health, and specifically focus on one chemical today, which is air pollution. We study many chemicals, but today I'm just going to talk about air pollution. And why air pollution? It has multiple effects on human health. We know that it has effects on birth and growth outcomes. It has effects on things like asthma and cardiometabolic outcomes, but also behavioral and mental health effects. Jackson Liu from MIT published a systematic review of 178 papers showing associations between concurrent exposure to air pollution. So what's my exposure today? And what's my level of happiness, annoyance, and anxiety, mental disorders, cognition, and even decision making? Um, one of my favorite studies in this paper is that baseball umpires make more wrong calls on days with high air pollution. And that's not because they can't see the ball through the smog. It's really because something's going on with their decision making. And we published a review of the um, human epi studies looking at prenatal air pollution exposure and neurodevelopment. And, and show how this exposure is associated with things like attention deficit disorder or risk for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism spectrum disorders, um, and anxiety, as well as challenges with academic skills. So um, the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health is housed next door and directed by Julie Herbstman. There are three birth cohorts. The mothers and newborns were recruited in 1998, and that um, cohort was really started in order to understand the effects of air pollution on human health. And we recruited only black and Latina women into the study because this was um, designed to look at health disparities early, a long time ago. I mean, really showing sort of how uh, on the leading edge of this issue Columbia has been. And then the um, sibling hermanos cohort is the second cohort. This was Dr. Herbstman's R00. These are the second born children of these mothers. And I actually did my career development award um, in that cohort. And now the Fair Start cohort, we're still actively recruiting. And our hope is that by, um, by probably 2024, because of the pandemic, to have 1,500 mothers across all three cohorts. So I'm going to talk today about the moms in moms and newborns and siblings. They live largely in northern Manhattan and Washington Heights. As I said, they're black or Latinx. They had to be healthy, non-smokers, um, and <clears throat> it turned out that they were mostly low income, and 64% of them had a high school diploma, so fairly low levels of education. 
In this cohort, we measure exposure to air pollution. The one I'm going to talk about today is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Those are compounds that are formed from the incomplete combustion of organic material. And we measure these in various ways through questionnaires or geographic information systems like satellite data and personal exposure, which I'll talk about today, where we have moms wear an air monitoring backpack for 48 hours in the third trimester of pregnancy. They wear it all day long. They put it next to their bed when they go to sleep. And then we extract, well, there's a filter in it. We um, can take the filter out and send it to the lab and extract these PAHs. We can, and that gives us a personal measure rather than a, a more gross average of what was the average air pollution on your block, you know, if I geocoded your data. Uh, so this personal measurement is much more um, refined. And then we can look at urinary metabolites or these biological markers of PAH DNA adducts, which are compounds that are formed when individuals are exposed to these air pollutants. And I'm going to talk about these DNA adducts and the backpack data today. Um, so as I mentioned, there was evidence that air pollution is associated with academic skills. And these studies are pretty convincing with 16,000 or 200,000 or 4,000 kids showing that early life exposure to different kinds of air pollutants is associated with, for example, um, lower math and science scores or the need for more academic support in school. And so um, beginning there, I knew we had this exposure and we had this outcome that I was interested in, and I really wanted to try to understand the pathway and the mechanism and what might be going on. And so using cognitive neuroscience, I started thinking about what were some candidate mediators uh, in this process. And we thought about these domain general capacities. And domain general, uh, to contrast with domain specific, like things that reading researchers use, for example, phonological awareness. So we know that if you can play with sounds and say cup, but now change the k to p, and it becomes pup. That's a huge predictor of whether you're going to have trouble learning to read. But that's a domain-specific skill, and that left lateralized reading circuit is very domain-specific. And I was interested in more domain general capacities that might underlie learning and also be uh, vulnerable to the kinds of things that ch children living in economic disadvantage would uh, be confronting all the time. And so. The, um, we try to interrogate this both looking at the brain and behavior. And one candidate mediator that I was interested in is inhibitory control. Uh, why inhibitory control? Again, because there's pretty good literature that executive functions and sometimes specifically inhibitory control are associated with academic outcomes. So I'm just going to pause. I want to define this term inhibitory control. Uh, I'm going to do another activity. When I move my finger, just look at my finger. OK? So just move your eyes. Now, when I move my finger, look at the other finger. Do you feel how much harder that is? So you have to put the brakes on, not look at the motion, and activate a different rule. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about inhibitory control. And um, so there's pretty convincing evidence that there's uh, associations between inhibitory control and academic skills. And then in my work with Rachel Marsh during my K award, I was especially interested in the brain mechanisms underlying inhibitory control in reading. So we did this study. This is, I'm going to keep showing these little um, pictures of our model. Um, here I'm talking about the brain to reading. And um, I was really interested in, could I show this? I had this theory that when kids learn to read, they learn word families like rat, cat, fat, fat, mat, hat, lat, tat. You can do that in your head, right? And it's like an overlearned habit, which as neuroscientists we know depends on the dorsal striatum and these frontostriatal circuits. And so I hypothesized that this might be implicated in reading disorder. And um, particularly because after kids learn this word family, then they have to look at a word like this. And they have to see this salient visual detail, which in school we call the magic E. And then they have to put the brakes on and say, oh, this isn't rat. Oh, there's the magic E. Oh, the magic E makes this vowel say his name. That means this is rate. Right? That's a lot. And most of us who learn to read easily do all that implicitly without thinking about it, um, which is how inhibitory control kind of works. Right? It's not something you actively, usually consciously engage. But for kids with reading problems, this is much harder. And my hypothesis was, um, that, that it might, but it's much harder for them to read the word rate versus rat. And my hypothesis was it could be due to failure in inhibitory control. So we took a group of kids who had reading disorder. Uh, this was work funded by the Promise Project. And we compared them to typically developing kids. And what we saw was that the um, children with reading disorder overactivated a right frontal region during the resolution of cognitive conflict or during an inhibitory control task in the scanner that was not reading related. It was very similar to this finger task with a bunch of arrows um, called the Simon Spatial Incompatibility Task. And what was more interesting was that 
the, as the um, kids activated this right frontal region, their reading scores were higher. And so we really understood this to be a compensatory mechanism, which fits in with this um, view of the neural signature of dyslexia, that these kids overactivate right um, hemisphere regions. And so this, bringing me back to um, our conceptual model, gave pretty good uh, support for this leg. So the last leg that we were interested in is this one. Why would I think that air pollution might have anything to do with inhibitory control? And my first clue was that from those epidemiology studies I talked about earlier, we know it's associated with autism spectrum and attention problems, anxiety problems, all disorders that have a transdiagnostic feature of difficulty with self-regulation. So um, in 2016, oh, so let me say, right, we just published this actually in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews where we did um, look at all of the animal models and their targets of um, air pollution. And what we found was that these kinds of air pollutions, PAHs, traffic-related air pollutants, and particulate matters are converging on the dopamine system and um, causing reductions in striatal dopamine and sometimes also in um, frontal um, cortical dopamine and then changes in the hippocampus, both in terms of neuroinflammation and structure and brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This paper actually looks at these as risk factors for psychiatric outcomes, uh, which I'm not talking about today, but it's um, the same mechanism and targets of air pollution in the brain. And so knowing that air pollution and PAHs were targeting dopamine uh, gave me some support for this idea that um, since dopamine underlies the inhibitory control system, that air pollution could be influencing inhibitory control. And so um, coming back to this model, I was looking to see, does PAH associate with inhibitory control? And we did this paper in 2016 uh, where we, we looked at over time in the children's center cohort in a couple hundred kids, whether um, from age three to 11, what happened to their self-regulatory capacity. And so on the y-axis, I'm showing you deficient self-regulation, which is a score from the child behavior checklist, and it's parent ratings of their children's behavior. And what we saw was that for the kids, these are the non-exposed kids who don't have DNA addicts in their cord blood at birth. And as um, they got older, they showed less dysregulation, which is what you'd expect. That's the normal developmental pattern. But in the exposed kids, we saw a much flatter trajectory, suggesting that prenatal exposure to air pollution was, in fact, having some influence on children's self-regulatory capacities. And then my con colleague, um, Monica Gooksens, did this really beautiful study in about 800 kids and showed that um, fine particulate matter was associated with reductions in cortical thickness in cognitive control regions in the brain and that those changes mediated performance on inhibitory uh, control task. So all of this to say, we felt pretty confident about this leg of the model. And so I came back to the folks at the CCCEH and I said, I really want to test out this model um, in our kids. So we are going to need their academic skills and we're going to need to look at their inhibitory control capacity. So we had the air pollution from prenatal. And actually, Virginia Rao had measured their inhibitory control at age 8 to 12. This is from NEPSI. This is a task we use all the time. You can try it. You just have to name the direction the arrow is going on the baseline task. So that's up, down, 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 up, down, up, up. But now in the inhibition trial, you guys can try this along with me. If an arrow is filled in, you say the opposite. So we're going to say up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down. So you can feel again, right? Put the brakes on, do some different rule. And so we had these data from the kids at age eight to 12. And I said to people over at Mailman, like, could we please measure their reading since we've been following these kids for 14 years and no one's measured their reading, writing, or math. We've given them IQ tests at four different times, CBCL every other year, myriad surveys, uh, full neuropsych at age 12, but no academic skills. So we acquired reading, writing, and math at age 14. That took a few years. Uh, and when we had 200 kids, we, um, conducted this study that we published last year. So on the x-axis, I'm showing you prenatal airborne PAH, and on the y-axis, inhibitory control during childhood, and we found a significant association such that higher levels of air pollution were associated with reduced performance on an inhibitory control task. So similar to our 2016 finding, but instead of parents rating the kids, now the kids were actually doing the inhibitory control task. We replicated the well-known finding that inhibitory control is associated with academic skills. I'm showing you inhibitory control on the x-axis and reading comprehension on the y-axis. This is at, uh, so inhibitory control at age 12 and reading comprehension at age 14, pretty strong association. And then we tested the full mediation and found that indeed inhibitory control is acting as a mediator 
on the pathway from exposure to both reading comprehension and math capacities in these kids. Um, and so the next thing we hope to do is look at this in the brain and interrogate the circuits that underlie inhibitory control. Um, and I have a new R01 where we're sort of able to do this as an add-on, but we're hoping, um, as Jeremy alluded to, to get this Learning Disability Innovation Hub, which I'm gonna talk about at the end of the talk today, uh, and really um, have more resources to look at these questions. So I've been talking about air pollution, and that's one exposure, but people aren't exposed to a single exposure at a time. People are exposed to multiple chemicals at a time. You don't just have air pollution, you also have bisphenols leaching out of the things you drink out of, and all of these terrible chemicals that are coming out of containers that people leave places. Um, and in addition, if you live in economically disadvantaged conditions, you're differentially at risk for these exposures because you live in neighborhoods where these exposures are sourced. And those tend to be neighborhoods that are um, also um, presenting more social stress challenges. So children who live in economic disadvantage have increased risk for these kinds of chemical exposures, but also for things like maternal depression, material hardship, um, neighborhood crime and um, poverty, and even um, increased risk of threat of violence from police, et cetera. And these are the kinds of social risk factors that in um, the lab we're considering now in, in, in collaboration with some really excellent um, um, other investigators, and I'll talk about some of this work. So we started looking at interactions between exposures, and um, this work that I'm gonna tell you about in the next few slides takes me away from academic skill outcomes, more into mental health, but I'm gonna come back to academic skills, so bear with me. I started working with, um, right, and so this is the headline, youth from economically disadvantaged backgrounds are at increased risk for chemical and social exposures. So I was working with David Pagliaccio, who was at the time the career development investigator in the CCCEH, and is now um, a principal investigator here in our department, and is a fantastic neuroscientist who had spent a lot of his graduate work thinking about stress and how it affects the brain. And he noticed that we had all of these fantastic measures of stress, like moms rating themselves on social support, maternal perceived stress, demoralization, et cetera, beginning some of these measures in the prenatal period and repeatedly measured over time, over 15 years. Um, in this particular study, David made a composite score of moms' ratings of these things when children were five years old. And then he wondered if these exposures would um, be exacerb the, the well-known association between these exposures and mental health outcomes, if those would be exacerbated by prenatal exposure to air pollution. And so using um, prenatal PAH with the backpack data, David um, did this study and showed uh, on the x-axis is early life stress composite, on the y-axis is child behavior checklist attention problems at age 11. And what he found is really fascinating that the children who had high levels of prenatal air pollution exposures, so that's the green line, had a strong association between their mom's rating of lifetime of life stress when the kids were five and the children's attention problems at age 11. But in the red line, this is showing you that for the kids who didn't have this prenatal air pollution exposure, there's really no association between stress and this attention problems. And the same was true for thought problems on uh, the CBCL at age 11. And this got me and David to scratch our heads when we were writing the discussion and think, so what's causing this double hit? Like, what's the biological mechanism under that? Why do stress and air pollution go together like this? And David knew from his work, um, in his graduate work, that stress influences hippocampus, and that those effects can be buffered by hippocampal brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And in our investigations into animal models, we had realized, as I showed you, that air pollution targets hippocampal BDNF. And so if you're exposed and that's reducing, if you're exposed to air pollution and it's reducing your BDNF, then you don't have the thing you need to buffer the social stressors. And so that was our hypothesis in that paper. And then I realized we could kind of test this hypothesis with some data from my K award. Um, so we looked at prenatal PAH, postnatal stress, and brain structure, specifically hippocampal structures and hippocampal subfield volumes. Um, and so we were asking if stress moderated the association between air pollution and hippocampal volumes and subfields. Uh, we had these um, measures of stress, and we tested first each one against the hippocampal volume because we have only 41 kids in this sample, so we needed to keep our models pretty simple. 
And only maternal perceived stress was associated with hippocampal volume. So we moved on in the second stage of this paper to look at maternal perceived stress, I'll show you that on the x-axis, and hippocampal volume on the y-axis, and the moderating effects of prenatal exposure to air pollution, and indeed found that only in the children with high levels of prenatal pH exposure did we see an association between stress and hippocampal subfield volumes. We also saw this in the dentate gyrus. Um, and this paper has been provisionally accepted at Biological Psychiatry Global Open for a special issue on the exposome, so we're pretty happy about that. Um, the next thing we did was ask, um, is there a meaningful endpoint or outcome here? And so, uh, you know, given my interest in the lab and going back to how does the brain relate to outcomes, we saw that hippocampal volumes were associated with um, visual spatial abilities. So on the y-axis, this is visual spatial or performance IQ on the short form of the IQ test. So we think maybe we've identified an etiologic underpinning of um, developmental visual spatial disorder for the first time. So as I promised, I'm coming back to academic skills. Uh, Dr. Paige Greenwood, I think she's here, yeah, she's here, is um, a T32 fellow in child psychiatry. This is her, if you see her around, say hi. This is her first year at Columbia. She's amazing, neuroscientist. And she was interested in interrogating how material hardship might contribute or moderate the associations between air pollution and academic skill outcomes. And so we have these measures of material hardship that ask in the last year, have you not had enough money to provide shelter or food or, how, or clothing or medicine, et cetera, for your children? And what Paige found on the x-axis is air pollution and on the y-axis is basic reading. And she found that only for the kids who have high material hardship is there an association between prenatal exposure to air pollution and basic reading. For these kids, I know these lines look a little sloped. Actually, their slopes don't differ from zero. So for the kids with average heart material hardship or low material hardship, there's no association between air pollution and reading. It's only for the kids who have high levels of material hardship. And this is under review for a special issue on the built and social environment influences on children's academic skills. Um, OK. So we've gotten some traction with this theory and our model, and I'm gonna talk about future directions. One place where I'm happy to have some traction is in the DSM. Um, I was, so in the old DSM-5, this is what we had about environment and learning disorders. It said prematurity or very low birth weight increases the risk for specific learning disorder, as does prenatal exposure to nicotine. Roger, over and out. So as the text revisor for the chapter on DSM-5, I thought, wow, maybe I can add some information here. Uh, and in fact, got this whole hefty paragraph in where I talk about um, socioeconomic conditions being risk factors and neurotoxicants, um, including air pollution, nicotine, flame retardants, lead, manganese, and also that it's not just the categorical diagnosis, but this idea that problems in reading or math are associated with these risk factors. And so tr trying to sort of shift our view away from just a categorical diagnosis to a dimensional view. Um, where else are we going? This LD Innovation Hub. So this is a P20 mechanism, which is a mini center, um, and it's a um, lead up to a P50, we hope. Um, we submitted this thing called the Columbia Psychiatry, Psychology, and Public Health Collaborative Learning Disabilities Innovation Hub. The innovation piece in the RFA means high risk, high reward. You don't need preliminary data. Of course, we had a little. Um, and so what we're proposing is to bring together cognitive neuroscience, environmental epidemiology, and applied educational psychology or neuropsychology to really go after these kinds of problems that children with uh, living in economically disadvantaged conditions are experiencing. So we have a leadership core. This was required where we would um, train investigators in how to engage with the um, community, and that's led by Virginia and Jeremy and myself, where we hope to cut across basic science, public health, and learning disability researchers and bring people into our hub activities uh, and try and expand people's understandings and views and interests. And then we have a research project, which I'm running with David Pagliaccio. So a P20 has one research project and one core. The P50 would have three projects and two cores, we hope, someday. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our research project that we're proposing. Um, this is back to our conceptual model that I've been talking about all day, but expanded a little bit where we have air pollution to academic outcomes, and we've added in these um, social um, factors as moderators. And then um, these are our mediators, which we've done a lot of work on inhibitory control, and that's pretty well studied. And as I said, I really want to try to take what we know from systems neuroscience and apply it to learning disorders. So the um, innovation piece here is to look at reinforcement learning. There's very little work thinking about how reinforcement learning contributes to reading. 
And why reinforcement learning? Why am I interested in that? You know, if you think what it's done for our field for understanding serious mental um, health problems like schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, Tourette's, it's, it's pretty remarkable how this bit of neuroscience has moved those um, fields forward. And I think if we could apply this to learning problems, we would uh, probably make some good progress. Um, so let me just explain, so this is the, the part of the model, right, from reinforcement learning to reading, but let me just explain a little bit about reinforcement learning. These are about prediction errors when the, um, your expected reward and the actual reward you get don't match. That's when you have a prediction error. So here's a monkey, he's gonna get some juice, he's gonna make some action in response to something on the screen. And when um, he, there's a positive prediction error when something happens on the screen and he does something and he's not expecting a reward, but he gets one. That's kind of a happy moment, probably. And then, in the negative uh, prediction error condition, something happens on the screen, the monkey does an activity, he's expecting the reward, the reward, and he doesn't get it. And these kinds of rewards are coded in the striatum by increases and decreases in um, dopamine, and there's beautiful optogenetic work in rodent models that I don't have time to teach you about today, but they're, they're really persuasive. So if um, moving from there, why would I think that these prediction errors have anything to do with readings? This is my last reading lesson for you today. We're gonna learn the int family. Int is I-N-T. Um, you can read these along with me. We put an M in front of int and we get mint. You can try these in your mind. Flint, lint, try this one. Now read this, right? That's an irregular word. So if you applied the rule correctly, you would have been expecting the reward that you read the, the word correctly, but it's not correct. So you're, you get a negative prediction error. And my hypothesis is that if children are um, exposed to, to air pollution early in life, that will affect the dopamine function. And if their dopamine system isn't working correctly, they can't encode these negative prediction errors, and that might explain why when children with reading problems confront the same word over and over, they continue to make the same mistake because they're not encoding these negative prediction errors the way their typically developing peers are. So to test that, we're really interested in uh, dopamine, and um, I'm sure this isn't new to many people here in this audience today, that we can now image dopamine in children in large part thanks to the work of Guillermo Jorge and his colleagues where we can look at downstream um, metabolite of dopamine called neuromelanin that binds to iron and we can look in the midbrain at the substantia nigra and the VTA and quantify how much neuromelanin is there as a proxy for dopamine function. So we've done a little bit of this in 25 kids. This is data we submitted uh, you know, right at the end before our review, you can submit new data. So we submitted this, um, and I think it probably helped. Uh, we are looking at neuromelanin and reading. This is from a supplement, an, a COVID supplement that I got for my career development award, actually, where we've now scanned 25 kids uh, with a neuromelanin sequence. And so I'm talking about the brain to reading here, and you can see um, in the VTA a pretty strong association between neuromelanin and basic reading scores with a p-value of 0.019. We only ran these two tests, so this would pass any kind of correction you wanna do. Um, in the substantia nigra, the association is not significant, it's trend level 0.07. So I don't know, when this sample gets bigger, will we see this effect for the substantia nigra and the VTA, or is this um, um, really just a VTA story? But we hope to keep going with this. So how do we translate this? I'm just wrapping up here. How do we translate all this research to action? Um, I have a couple of global initiatives that I'm part of, which are pretty exciting. And um, I do those with someone named Darby Jack, who's over in Mailman. And he is the PI of the Ghana Randomized Air Pollution Health Study, GRAFS, where for all the work I've told you about today about air, outdoor air pollution, there's very little known about indoor air pollution and its effects on neurodevelopment. In fact, there's one study of prenatal exposure to indoor air pollution, or HAP, household air pollutants, and children's neurodevelopment in 39 children in Guatemala. So we really just don't understand how this is affecting children. And Darby um, randomized families to either receive a liquid petroleum gas stove or continue cooking with their three-stone cook stove in rural Ghana in um, Contempo. And this graph shows you that the um, intervention worked. There's much lower uh, PM 2.5s in the households of the families with the LPGs. And he did this with women who were pregnant. And so the intervention really manipulates exposure to indoor air pollution in the fetal brain. And after the first year of life, the grant was over and the petroleum ran out. So these kids then went back to community levels of household air pollutants. So it's 
a sad story, but a beautiful experimental design. And we have um, an R01 pending to measure, these children are now seven, to measure their neurocognitive functioning and inhibitory control and behaviors associated with that. And that would be the first demonstration, causal demonstration of the effects of air pollutants on neurodevelopment. And we have another grant that we're planning to submit for October where we'll image these children uh, in a 1.5T scanner in Kumasi in Ghana, and hopefully also with um, these new hyperfine portable small MRIs and, and try to compare and see what kind of uh, information we can get because those, those hyperfine MRIs will allow us to reach people in much more rural areas. And then the other collaboration is again with Darby and Kiros Birhani, who's the um, chair of um, statistic, biostatistics at Mailman, and they run the East Africa GeoHealth Hub. And um, in, it's a U2R and a U01, and we got a fantastic score. And my piece of this is to work with investigators in um, Ethiopia at Addis Ababa University and collect inhibitory control and academic achievement data in adolescents in Ethiopia who have been followed since birth so we can replicate this same model. And it's just also important to think about ways to translate this research to action and think about that there are some things we can do that will reduce exposure and really help kids. So we do all of this to improve treatment, right? Um, what I'm hoping is to find partners, or if I can't find them to do it myself, to develop modules that we can add on to traditional reading instruction. So I've been told there are about 200 people tuning in today. That means about 20 of you will have a kid with a learning problem. And so you may know the words Orton-Gillingham. That's the state of the art for how we treat these problems. This is a picture to show you Orton's innovation was to say, if kids are having trouble matching this weird shape to this weird sound, buh, it might help if you gave them a picture of something like a bat. So they learn this. B is bat says buh. And by putting that semantic meaning in the middle, it helps their learning. And that's fantastic. And that's the state of the art. And I'm proud to tell you that Samuel Orton was a Colombian the sad thing is he was here in the 1920s, and if we treated heart disease today here the way we did in the 1920s, there'd be no open heart surgery, there'd be no angiography, we wouldn't understand heart health, we wouldn't understand lifestyle factors and their contributions to that, or cholesterol and have a drug like Lipitor. So we're, we're really kind of in the dark ages. We need to take everything we know from systems neuroscience and circuit psychiatry and apply it to these problems, and then apply it to interventions, uh, hopefully by targeting things like inhibitory control, reinforcement learning, or the effects of stress in the brain, and and, and really move the needle for these kids who are growing up in economic disadvantage. And as I showed you in that early slide, at tremendous disadvantage relative to their advantaged peers in terms of even their reading scores in fourth and eighth grade. And um, what an intractable problem that's been for the last 20 years. Hopefully, by doing this, we'll make some progress. And so a uh, big thank you to you all for listening and doing my exercises and to the families who participated um, the research workers, it really is an incredible undertaking to get these kinds of studies done. These are people in my lab who uh, I couldn't really function without, and all of these incredible collaborators. And thank you especially to um, Rachel Marsh and Virginia Rao for mentoring me in my career development award so I could get here. Thank you.